But all right, we're starting to transition right on over into Just Talking, where our guest is joining us. I believe she's in Philadelphia. I don't know where she's at. She's moving so quick. We got Bevelyn BT, who's joining in with us. She's the co-founder and evangelist at uh, At The Wells Ministry. So how's it going, fam? Hi, how's it doing? And guess what? You get a two-for-one package deal because my partner crime is with me. Hey, what's Hi. good? Hi. I love Hi. this. <laughs> this is great because I, I'm, you know, Marissa and I, we're very beyond blessed to have you to, you know, join the show uh, because obviously, you know, with the Chris Collins show, th- this is bringing a millennial voice, you know, for our generation because there's too many times talking heads in the media try to speak yeah. for us as if we're a piece of recycled news and we're here to break yeah. the mold and I see you in the streets almost every single day. And I think it's a powerful thing. So let's get right on into it because I know you are against this whole Black Lives Matter movement. And what would you and what would you like to see happen to strengthen race relations? Well, the reality is race relations, uh, to be honest with you, will never be strengthened until accountability comes into play. Um, The thing is, race relations is the issue when you are pointing the finger at someone else. They don't like me because I'm black. They don't like this because of this. And, and it's really just a, a, a pile of excuses to to, stre- to kind of uh, deflect what's really going on. And it's an internal issue. Uh, and so for me personally, I would love to see the black community and all communities rise up and take accountability for themselves. Um, I would love for the black community to start loving themselves, stop killing themselves. Abortion is one of the biggest killers of the African-American community. Yet no one looted the Planned Parenthood. They, they abort babies left and right, and then they talk about Black Lives Matter. They kill each other left and right. Black on black crime is a huge thing. And you don't see Black Lives Matter rioting there. You don't even see white people. If they're white people are not going to those neighborhoods. They will march for Black Lives Matter, but they're staying in the suburban neighborhoods where they're not getting robbed and killed. And then the, I, the thing is, the white guilt, I can't stand. Oh. <laughs> well, I have a, well, I have a question on that, right? Because yes, I agree yeah. with you. If you look at where all the protests are happening, they're in rich white neighborhoods or affluent neighborhoods. Yeah. They're never in the hoods, uh, unlike the Watts riots, 1960s that my mom um, was around for and so on. But what I have a quick question for about that is as a white person, because Black Lives Matter as you know, because you, you have a different philosophy of that, as a white person on here, what, other than taking accountability for myself, is there something that I can do as a white person to help strengthen that, those relationships? Well, okay, that's a good question. Let's, 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 let's break it down like this. What have you already been doing as a white person to strengthen the black community? For me, I have, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I make sure that my friend circle is has included black asian latinx white i make sure i sit down in those conversations so i think that's one of the first things i have um on top of that teaching i teach i try to make sure i'm bringing in curriculum written by black authors or other poc authors out there so those are just two of the basic ones that i do across on the board okay so this is the thing me personally i have friends of all colors I don't, I don't pick them, and I'm not, I'm not countering you at all. Just hear my heart. Um, mm-hmm. I don't pick them based off of color, and I know you're not saying that, but if I just meet someone and we get along, we have a mutual understanding of certain things, you a friend. You know, I have a friend right now, she's like, look, look, Spanish. Like, it's just, it, I, I don't just say, okay, yeah, I like her, she's Spanish. I like her, she's black. Oh, let me read that author because he's black. Let me check him out. No, 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 no. The context and the character is the only thing I focus on. I wish white people as a whole would start to concern themselves with just that, character moral character and at the end of the day no matter what color they are tell them the truth if it's like listen i don't want to hang with you not because you're black but it's because you be stealing i'm not interested you're trifling you don't take care of your kids you don't do this you don't do that i don't want to roll with you i mean i feel like white people are so quick to want to defend themselves rather than tell the truth they, they, they're going to find themselves just playing ping pong with the wall <laughs> because at the end of the day no matter how much you ping pong and try to defend yourself if they hate you and they're racist because you're Right, there's nothing you can say to change that. But at the end of the day, like, listen, if you cool and we, we got the same small foundation, we rolling. But if you not, then I don't want to hang with you. I don't care if you black, blue, purple, orange. 
I feel you. And I, you know what? I really love that you mentioned the word accountability. And I have a clip here. Um, Marissa, if you could share it. This was on the Sean Hannity show when, uh, when he was speaking with one of the individuals, the father of Horace Lorenzo, 19-year-old uh, African-American that got killed in Seattle Chop because yes. law enforcement couldn't come in to provide aid for the situation. And I think that's such a real thing because, I mean, Black Lives Matter, they keep preaching that they want to hold law enforcement accountable for their actions, yet we got an individual killed during this weird-ass block party, supposedly the Seattle mayor saying, and even the governor never reached out. The mayor didn't reach out. Law enforcement nope. hasn't yeah. reached out to the father. Nope. Why have, hasn't Black Lives Matter speaked up on this issue, Bevelyn? Oh, and we got the clip right here. Let's do the, the clip, and then, Bevelyn, right. you can answer. Hold on. Let's play that clip. But if our politicians can't agree on one thing and can't fix one thing, and that's safety and security, they have failed in their job. And if I don't care what party you're in, if you don't support safety and security, and a good education for our children, get out of the way, because America can do better than that. Let me, That's add, what I let me add one to that. Let me add yes. one, let me add one to that. Safety, security, and accountability. Amen. All those run hand in hand. We can't have one without the other. And family. Yes. And so you, you see with this kind of situation that's happening in Seattle, and there's still no word from any media outlet unless, you know, the Chris Collins show is going to bring it up. But how do you feel about this situation, Bevelyn? Because I'm really shocked that Black Lives Matter has not spoken up on this issue. Uh -huh. Well, let's break, let's break down the narrative. Let's break down the narrative. Chaz was built due to Black Lives Matter, right? They wanted you to create a city of love and peace, an area of love and peace, and there would be no police. And we would just all be in kumbaya. Black people just don't need to leave. And, and we just we just want to stay away from them, right? So this was, this was pushed from Black Lives Matter. And then, interestingly enough, a black man gets killed in chat. Right? So now, yeah. this was a pawn. This was a pawn. Uh, politicians, I don't know anybody in their right mind can, who can really come out and address and explain a pawn. A pawn was just a throwaway. It was a throwaway thing that went bad. So their silence really is speaking, but people are so ignorant, they're not paying attention to the silence. The silence is telling you everything you need to hear. It took for that young black man, actually two of two, 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 two to die, for them to actually enforce police and push police out because it cut their narrative. They were trying to, the, the mayor and that whole system and the powers that be were trying to use chance to prove the need, the, 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 the need of not having or, or the um, unnecessary need of police, right? And this was an agenda for them to make money. They wanted to cut that budget so that they could funnel that money. Because if you think any black person in that community is going to see that money, you're nuts. It's never mm -hmm. going to happen. They're going to make big private security businesses and funnel that money right into their pocket. That's a lot of money to be cut, right? I feel you. So it was all a finesse. It was all a finesse, but it went wrong. It went wrong and it proved, yes, we do need our police. Well, let me ask you this, Bevelyn. Let me ask you this, because I've never heard anybody mention this before. And it's, you said this in one of your videos. I believe it was your Dear White People video. And you were basically yes. saying, saying, you know, do you think that the civil rights movement in the 60s was a failure? And I always thought that's quite a fair question because, I mean, obviously you got people like Ice-T who's going on his Twitter account telling all his followers that this is the civil rights movement 2.0. Do you believe that this is a 2.0? Oh, my God. I see the same one who's a married with a white woman, been with a white woman all this nice cocoa and all that. They've they, been on white shows. His check gets out by white people. Now you talking about civil rights. I see the kick rock, okay? I see ain't even gangster no more, all right? So, bye, I see. We not even know. But I see she's off. The reality is this. It ain't got nothing to do with civil rights because civil rights is over and done with. The fact that me and you can on the phone right now talking in freedom the platform that black people have it's not what we had back then but we have it now but the sad part is we are so ignorant we are we rather go backwards than just advance and excel with the platform we have now so they're basically throwing the middle finger to malcolm x and martin luther king and all of these people who fought and died for our freedom 
it's so true. I mean, I, I mean, you saw it this week. I mean, the NFL is trying to get around this and trying to see, you know, because they've always felt like they screwed up the situation with Kaepernick. And now the breaking yeah. news is during week one, they're going to be playing the black national anthem during week one. I feel like this doesn't do anything to fix the problem. And I got to say, because I always thought this was pretty funny. You've even dubbed um, even Steph Curry and you've even said that Snoop Dogg is the super house Negro. And I know that Steph Curry has even spoke out against the NFL for playing, you know, the black national anthem. And do you actually see this actually doing anything? Because I'm with Steph. I mean, I do feel like this doesn't fix any of the issues that African-Americans are trying to address in this country. Well, you know what? I think for me, if, if, if that's what the case is, that it should be. Because Steph started to kind of like the debate. I'm going to be honest with you. The only reason why I really love Steph Curry is because he really wanted to confess, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But he started to really fall for this agenda with, you know, black people being oppressed quality, you know, his wife, they were kind of falling with that agenda, and so if he's decided to, like, go against the black anthem, then okay, cool, but at the end of the day, it's not just about standing against the black anthem, it's about standing against the entire gym entity, the agenda in totality, the homosexual agenda, the, the, the Black Lives Matter agenda, which is totally demonic, all of these agendas, especially him as a Christian, is supposed to stand, and it should be a clear thing. And, and why? why I say that and why would you say uh, and why would you say that something like black lives matter is uh, demonic i mean that's uh, that's i mean that's a quite a strong word to say towards a huge group of individuals in this country who feel that they're being oppressed right now in this nation do you think all of them are demonic cuz i know that there are certain black lives matter supporters who are christians who are evangelists i mean okay but this is the thing do you understand the foundation of christians that's what i would ask that person because if they understood the foundation of a Christian, a Christian means that you die, you die to self, and you take up the identity of Christ. We as a Christian, I don't identify with just being black. Now, I have a black body, too. I'm black, but I, my, my life and my soul and my identity is not in my color. Let's be real. You have certain people that are the same color as you that like to raise kids. They like to steal. They like to lie. Does that mean that we're, that we're brother and sister and we roll together? Our moralistic foundation is not my brethren is based off of character. That's what the Bible says. My mother and brothers are supposed to hear the word of God and obey it. So with that being said, if you are truly a Christian, you cannot stand for Black Lives Matter because Black Lives Matter is against men. It's a feminist organization. It's against the nuclear family. It's for abortion, which is the number one killer of African Americans. And it is LGBTQ. Uh, it is fights for LGBTQ. Well, that's what I always thought was really strange. Well, that's what I always thought was strange, Bevlin. I mean, I never understood how the Black Lives Matter movement immediately started turning into the LGBTQ plus movement. I and I don't know what July is going to be. I mean, do you have any predictions of what you see the next outrage being? Because I think monuments are, you know, it's still a thing, but I think there's going to be something new that's going to happen. Or is there a prediction that you could see in the horizon of, of outrage? <laughs> So yeah, I, 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 I have a hard time even thinking in. that because I've never heard any of these co-founders of Black Lives yeah, Matter yeah, even I speak. Did, I did well, I, and I must have to step in. What were you gonna say? It, it shouldn't matter whether, I mean, here's where we definitely do differ. It shouldn't matter whether someone is LGBTQ, lesbian, anything starting something, if right. it's a belief. I mean, because that's where we, we definitely have differing opinions on. And that's yeah, one that, that, that I mean, doesn't matter.
Well, well, let me throw this at you like this. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Beverly. Let me throw this at you because, yeah. I mean, I was talking about YouTuber Shane Dawson, right? And I feel like this kind of compares yeah. with even Christians on a level. You don't think that that same group that was back then, let's say 2013, has a different change of philosophy when they get older at 2020 and they start realizing as Christians that, you know, we could still be humans, we can be individuals, and we can still love everybody, not worrying about whether they're LGBTQ+. Plus. I mean, I think that's kind of what the real issue is. I mean, I, I understand that everybody's a child of God, and we should treat everybody as human. I am so with if you. Love is, if love is love, if love is love, right? If we, if we want to look at the concept of love, uh, God is love. And in, in the Bible, it gives you a definition of what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love bears all things. Love hopes all things. Love is not irritable. And love does not rejoice in yes. At the end of the day, two men, let me tell you what sex is. Because people don't understand the concept of sex. They say, oh, love is love. It's just a feeling. If that's the case, I can feel like I want to love a 10-year-old boy today and decide that I want to love a, a grown man tomorrow. That's not love. Love has nothing to do with how you feel. Love is a characteristic. And, and a person, that's why you see people that have been married for 30 years, they'll say, listen, it's the character of who this man I fell in love with. This is why I love him. Because even in the midst of our trials and tribulations, he was for you. We stood together. We rose together. That's love. And that's the problem. People equate love to a feeling. And that's why people are in and out of relationships, sleeping with every Tom, Dick, and Harry, but don't have no stability. So now the millennials feel like love is just a feeling for the moment, but y'all can't stay in the same relationship. And then the people that y'all follow, they jump from man to man to man, woman to woman to woman, talking about love, but they are so miserable inside because they miss the understanding of what love is. So the reality is two people come together to have sex. Sex is a form of worship. And the fruit of that, Worship is a base. So that's why God calls us to get married. And that way, when we unify with one another, when we have sex, we are worshiping God and thanking Him for what He made. Because God made sex. Sex hey, and hey. man did not make sex. Hey, fair enough, but I hope that we can come to an understanding, too, that I I think was sometimes on when I see you on the streets and you're definitely preaching the good truth. I mean, trust me, I'm all with you on everything. Yeah. But I feel like sometimes it can get a little too preachy, and I feel like sometimes if you just be real with some individuals, because, you know, God's not perfect. I mean, it's just like what Chris Rock used to say all the time. I mean, this is your radio station, right? So when you get on your radio station and you do your platform, how you do yours, you do what you do. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, but I'm just saying you're the same individual that's always pressing, uh, you know, Reverend Jackson and Al Sharpton as being these house Negroes because they're so preachy. But you're you kind of doing the same thing in the streets. I mean, that's the thing. I never said that they were house Negroes because they're preachy. I know video that. I said that they are house Negroes because they stand as token Negroes representing as the black community, but under a false narrative and a false agenda. These people are not real Christians. These people could care less about black people. What they do is they represent black people and they say, all black people are oppressed. Uh, we need more government. We need more of this. But we're, we're, we're treated equally. We need the government to do this and do that and represent this and represent that. But at the end of the day, they're only benefiting. Yet I'm in the hood every day. Like you said, you see me on the streets in the hood. I am yeah. seeing what liberalism is doing to my people. And Bevelyn, I, I my own people fall yeah. to the ground. Yes, and I wanted, Bevlin, I know, I'm not trying to cut you off, but I want to jump on this because you brought it up. You're on the streets, you're out there, and I love the quote you had um, that you talked about. Your mom told you at 14 to make sure you don't go on welfare. Yes. And I want to talk yep. about that because- That's a strong, that's, powerful message. That's one of the things I know we spoke about, um, how welfare yes. has destroyed black communities. So if you can yes. speak towards that, I would love that. Okay, boom. Think about it like this. Um, if- Let's just say uh, my sister, I'll give you an example. My sister was a manager of an electric company, okay? And what they did was they sold energy. And she was in charge of managing the team and bringing forth people that work. And it was kind of like a commission job, but the commissions were wonderful. If you if you just made six sales a week, you were, you were um, guaranteed to pull in $1,200 after tax every mm. week, okay? So Denise would go out and recruit and get these people to come in. And she would usually go to the hood. A lot of times when we have resources, we want to go back to our community and bring the jobs and the resources that and she, she got a couple of people and she said to me, Now mind you, my sister was not a Trump supporter. She was totally opposite of me. My sister said to me, You know what, Beth? I don't be listening to you, but I think you're right. Like, 
I want to hear this because I really do believe, I think this is such a strong, powerful message for millennials. So I hate to have you repeat yourself again, but I, I really do believe you have. We got, we got cut off. We got cut off right when you were talking about your sister who was different viewpoints, not a Trump supporter, came to you and said you had it right. Yes. She had a woman tell her that she would, she quit her job. And she said, I would rather leave and just get a check than work with you guys because it's too hard. Because they would go door knocking. They would have to go knock on doors. But it would be lucrative. And my sister's job was to build a team. That's how she made her money. The bigger mm -hmm. her team was, the more money she made. But she couldn't believe how people would rather stay home yeah, and that's the same argument, Beth, I don't know if you can hear us, but that's the same argument that right now the GOP is saying. Yeah, so all of that to say, yeah, that's the same thing, it's the same thing, but basically by you taking away a person's work ethic, okay, and this is biblically speaking, the Bible says a man that doesn't work doesn't eat. When you take away the work ethic, you take away the value. When your life dependency it's only on what you get at the beginning of the month. You you find a lot of time to do absolutely nothing. That's why you got kids. When we go to Baltimore, we see young kids. Like these kids be like 15, 16, 17 years old, dropped out of school, sitting on the block. You go up to them, you ask them, what's going on? What you doing? Nothing. Just chilling. They don't have an, they don't have, uh, an incentive to go and get educated in crime because everything has been handed out to them. All they know is give me, give me, give me. And I'm going to tell you something. They talk about COVID being more susceptible to white, I mean, black people. Black people are more able to get COVID, right? But think about it like this. A, a lot of the black community has been so submitted to the government that they do whatever the government says. So if the government says take this vaccine, they take it. If the government says do this, do that so you can get C and D, they do it. So a lot of them are going to the hospital being told do this and do that and do this and come to find out they're saying a lot of the black community Tested positive for COVID. You think that's a coincidence? Yeah, I mean, they're talking about that also right now with Africa with the vaccine, that all the trials are only in Africa. Um, uh -huh. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff coming out right yeah. now, too, about that. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So the reality is this we as the people have, have gotten so used to submitting to a government order ever since Lyndon B. Johnson. We've been so submissive to that order that now, if anything happens, we just we just are like sheep led to the slaughter. And we got more than enough time to do wrong. And I'm not saying it's about all black people, but I will say this. Every time you go to a city where it's, with a, where it's a, a, a full, where it's a Democrat city from the top to the bottom, you're going to see poverty, especially if black people live there. You're going to see high crime rates. You're going to see fatherlessness in the home. Every single Democrat, well, you, if you name any Democrat city where there was injustices and black men were killed, guarantee you it was a Democrat city every time. I feel you, Beverly, and I know we're starting to run out of time on Just Talking, so I wanted to hit you on this because I know millennials right now, we got a really sour taste in our mouth when it comes to both candidates. <laughs> and if you would say any kind of last words on that kind of notion for the millennial listening audience that's listening to you right now, what, what would you what, say to them? So what I'm saying is there's a very sour taste in a lot of millennials' mouths right now on both candidates, Joe Biden yeah. and even Donald Trump. And if you have yeah. any last final words that you could say for the millennial listening audience that is on the fence about even voting for either of these individuals, what would you like to say? Yeah, I would say this. I can guarantee you that you have a sour taste in your mouth because the media has told you to hate Trump. Uh, the celebrities have told you to hate Trump. Uh, you have been, you can guarantee that you've heard that Donald Trump said something. It goes back to when we were kids in school. Well, I heard that he said this, and I heard that he said that. Yeah, I don't like him either. So where everybody just kind of gangs up to hate something because it's cool. What I'm going to challenge millennials to do is use their noodles. It's this thing called yes. common sense. It's called common sense, but it's, it's really uncommon. But put two plus two together and make four. Recognize that our economy has shifted drastically in four years with Trump, a great white male president, while we were with a black president for eight years and only watched the decline of our economy. And recognize something. Whether you don't like America or not, this is 
is your country, this is where you live. There's no other country better than us. If Absolutely. America falls, who's going to catch us? Who's going to catch America if we fall? It's yeah, so go true, vote, Beverly. Go and vote. vote. Thank vote. you, Beverly. I'm so happy yes. that you preached this, and I know that we're starting to run out of time, but I, I can't thank you enough. I think you have such a strong, powerful voice. Keep continuing to do you and keep traveling across the station because it, it really listeners, means a lot. Where can our listeners find you? You can find me on Facebook at uh, Beverly Media on Facebook, Beverly Media on Instagram, and Beverly Media on YouTube. Much love, fam, and uh, we're with you all the way. And Thank just stay you safe so out much. there. And listeners, if you like what you're listening to, please go to thechriscollinshow.com and become a member today. Thanks, fam. All right. Bye, Have guys. a good one.